Professor Gupta, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, here today. I'm from the University of Bristol. Uh, it's a comprehensive, research-intensive university, and we are about an hour and a half southwest of London. Not many people have heard of us because we don't have a football team like Manchester or Liverpool. Um, but we are well-renowned. We're number 61 in the QS World Rankings, and in UK research, we're uh, second only to Cambridge. It's really great to be here today because yesterday our university launched its 2030 strategy and our first aim in that is to build a small number of deep research and education partnerships of scale in areas of strategic importance to the university because, just as uh, Professor Gupta says, now more than ever international collaboration is the core ingredient of research scale, international national relations and indeed civil impact trying to tackle some of the world's biggest problems. And for us, India is the number one country with whom we want to collaborate. Um, it's a great time for two reasons. The first is Brexit. Brexit is not a great thing. It's a dreadful thing. But it does mean that we are now looking beyond the UK for partnerships. And the new, economic, the new education policy in India has made it a very, very favourable place. Um, for us to come and do business. So um, I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm part of a small delegation um, of, of our university uh, univ build, look, uh, looking at um, Mumbai and Bangalore and we're now here in Delhi. So I just want to talk very briefly about the, the three areas of partnership collaboration that, um, that are of interest to us. So th the first is obviously education education and education partnerships are usually the first step in a, in, a, in a relationship between universities and two countries because you have students going back and forward, you have something that's embedded. So we've been setting up student exchange, summer programs, dual degrees, joint degrees, progressions, co-tutels of our PhD students and all of these activities have proved to be very fruitful in collaboration and even during COVID collaborative online international learning programs have been a great way to get students together. So education I would suggest is, is the first step and then to deepen those relationships we want to start looking at research and here what we've tended to do is have start with online seminars do a kind of a speed dating between faculties, find out who's got joint interests, then look for research funding opportunities, bid for these together, and then start to, to cement a really good um, reputation. We were, I would just like to pick up and strongly, strongly endorse what Professor Gupta said about doing things in collaboration. In June of this year, the, our Department of Education and Department of International Trade brought a delegation of 22 universities from the UK um, to, to India. And what we decided amongst ourselves as a UK delegation was that India is a very, very big pie and there is a lot of pie that we can share and so we've decided as a group that we want to work together to see how the UK with its particular regulations and India can work more closely together so I very much look forward to taking that agenda forward. The final thing that, that we um, wanted to look at and we've been asked to look at is industry collaborations and I know some of my colleagues are going to talk about this. It's incredibly important for the education part of our mission for our students to be trained with the skills that industry needs and to find good jobs and in our research collaborations it's incredibly important that the research that we do is relevant to industry problems. It's probably the most tricky part of this. I think the education part is the easiest part, the research part is slightly more difficult and embedding industry within everything we do is the most difficult but I would hope that together in partnership that's something we could crack so that we have a genuinely international education research and collaboration with our industries on both sides of the world. Thank you very much.
artist you to go next. Yes, thank you very much, uh, yeah. Dr. Gupta. I'm just uh, looking for the clicker. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about one aspect of uh, partnerships and networks in terms of some of the lessons from Australia's international education experience from the late 1980s to uh, pre-COVID times. In the late 1980s, Australia's education system uh, shifted quite substantially from an aid-based approach to export education to a trade-based approach. And in the years since, we've had some subsequent and significant fluctuations. And we can see during the 1980s to the period up to 2008 that there was significant growth. And that growth uh, has been attributed to changes to the general skilled migration programs, changes to financial requirements, changes to English language requirements, which together made it easier for students to obtain an international education visa to come to Australia. At the same time, government streamlined visa processes and changed the limits on hours of work. These things led to significant growth. However, these things change, and this period was followed by a period of decline. These factors are important as India uh, launches into uh, increased international education opportunities as one aspect of your partnerships and collaborations with other countries. During this period of decline from 2009 to 2013, immediately after the global financial crisis, there were changes to the English language requirements, skills testing and arrangements to trade-based visas. These constricted opportunities for students in terms of visa uh, processing. In 2009, there were significant concerns regarding safety and racism particularly for Indian students. Changes subsequently to the skilled migration program and the skilled occupational list also contributed to this decline phase. In the subsequent phase where we had growth up to the pre-COVID times, again there were changes to the migration settings which encouraged increased Indian student uh, participation and flows to Australian education. We've seen in many other systems that extensions to post-study work rights have a positive correlation in terms of international student mobility and this has certainly happened in Australia. Also at this time there was introduction of legislation to provide additional oversight of unscrupulous education providers and integrity of education as we've discussed and quality is of utmost importance as we seek to collaborate and have increased international student flows. During COVID times, obviously, this changed for everyone, everywhere. Before COVID, there were 570,000 international students in Australia, including nearly 150,000 Indian students across the schools, higher education and vocational education space. And while the number of partnerships grew pre-COVID, we are aware that there are some concerns in terms of these opportunities. Firstly, until the NEP 2020 and the introduction of the gift city requirements or regulatory arrangements, there have been to date no Australian offshore higher education campuses or other foreign campuses, and this will change. There were few India-Australia transnational education-based partnerships and this will change. And to date, only a number, a small number of joint PhD academies have been established. But we certainly look forward to this changing and opening up opportunities for further collaboration. By December 2021, there are only 250,000 international education students in Australia. 
However, there have been recent shifts to attract international students back, including, most importantly, Indian international students. Extension of permissible hours of work uh, changed opportunities for students. Extension of post-study work rights has been recognised as extremely important. There has been a shift to diversification rhetoric in terms of sender countries, courses and programs. And the Australian Government expects a correction to the international student figures. Indian students are returning to Australia. What we know from these, uh, this experience is that partnerships and networks are vitally important. The implementation of the NEP 2020 consolidates some of those opportunities, particularly in terms of regulatory forms governing transnational higher education and opportunities for further PhD academies and tie-ups. We also look forward to expanding opportunities for cross-border internships and obviously international research collaborations. What Australia's international education experience has taught us is that attention needs to be given to migration policy settings, eligibility criteria and pathways to ensure quality education for inbound and domestic uh, students, attention to work rights, financial and student wellbeing and integrity. There needs to be some clarity and coherence around migration and higher education policy settings. Settings. And just in closing, in pursuing partnerships and networks, our experience suggests that these things are vital. Attending to questions of student engagement, ensuring that economic conditions are conducive to students' learning environments, uh, attending to social conditions, attending to personal safety, particularly for young women, uh, attending to live in, living conditions, environmental conditions and opportunities for internships and uh, post-study employment. We certainly look forward to growing our partnerships and networks with India's higher education systems and bodies of students. Thank you. Uh, uh, just one moment while I, uh, yeah, I think uh, you highlighted very clearly uh, Australia's journey of uh, the growth and collaboration. In fact, I think we are all aware that in Australia, export of education servi uh, services, you know, it became a great industry to uh, ex services of education uh, became a great export earner. And that really is something that uh, has been very, very key in the growth of uh, your country. Uh, the, uh, you also highlighted some of the challenges and the solutions that were found by your government. And I think especially the COVID times, the changes that came about were uh, uh, very interesting for us to hear about. Thank you so much. Uh, may I now request uh, Kiran? Good afternoon. Um, in the last uh, few years, the world has changed. We all talk about the, the pandemic and today we talk about the post-pandemic era. So we are not very sure whether the pandemic is completely gone or not. But what has happened in the world of work is that uh, the digital transformation has taken over. The characteristics of the world of work has changed, as most of you know. And this has been putting pressure on higher education institutions today. You can today imagine a situation where all the skills and competencies that students require can be uh, had even from outside the university system. So there is a challenge that we are facing. The universities have to take care of the digital transformation within the universities but also respond to the digital transformation across. And this is possible only if we can work together, partner with institutions from across the world, but also with industry and other partners. Uh, I represent here Obrial Global, which is an association of in university associations. So we work with university associations in Latin America, in Africa, and in India. Uh, the chapter is headed by Dr. Vidya. Uh, 
and we have been having collaborative operations in the last many years, including EU funded projects, specifically looking at e-learning, looking at quality assurance issues, looking at skill uh, improvement, etc. We work with, uh, uh, as a group of institutions in India, uh, we work with the Indian, Indian Institute of Science, the IIT Chennai, of course Symbiosis, Jadopur University, etc. One interesting observation that we had was that it required an international project for Indian universities to come together. And so when we had the first project, which is called MILIS, which is into e-learning, many of our partners from uh, different uh, parts of the world, particularly from Europe, were amazed to see the kind of material content and digital content which is already available in India. And they wanted access to that content. So uh, today morning uh, there was this emphasis on the equity in terms of partnership and that's already there. Uh, universities would like to collaborate with India not necessarily only because there is a source to sink side, but also there's a lot of potential on, uh, from India. Today morning we also had this discussion regarding global leadership. And somehow, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, we look north. But if we want to take a leadership position, we have to look at the entire world. And there's a lot that we can offer to the South as well. So the South-South relationship also needs to be enhanced. An activity that uh, at uh, Obrial Global we are into. The other uh, aspect that needs to be discussed is regarding partnerships for what? Why do we get into partnerships? We have already looked at one or two dimensions of that partnership. But what is it there for the institution? What is it there for the students? What is it there for the country as a whole and for the industry? So what is this partnership uh, about? Can these partnerships be sustainable if we have a unidirectional uh, one? So if we are clear about what the partnerships are all about and what it contributes to the institution and the country, then it's a more sustainable partnership. We talked about uh, faculty equality, we talked about the global leadership. So what is it that we need from these partnerships to move forward? Are there faculty members available who can teach our students? Today technology allows that, so should everything be within the institution? Are we looking at internship, global internship? Are we looking at programs? double degrees, what is the scope of those partnerships? It has changed completely in the last two years in terms of what are the different possibilities that can come about due to these, uh, uh, due to these partnerships. And then we also have to look at and emphasize on, today morning we looked at uh, the digital, the, we looked at how uh, the different strengths of India, but I think the emphasis has to also be on employability. A word that perhaps we have not discussed at least today, but it has to be on employability. If universities are not taking care of employability, then we have, uh, uh, there is a problem. Uh, the latest reports show that only 11% of the, the in, in the US, 11% of uh, industry leaders fully agree that degrees contribute to skills required in the job, uh, in the world of work. Uh, that's a crisis that I was talking about. But that's where the partnerships come in. And these partnerships are extremely important because there are strengths in different aspects that we want to draw on. Um, it is also important for universities to have characteristics which we expect our students to have and something that as a leader we would like to have in the society and that is to learn from each other. And if we don't intrinsically as an institution do not have uh, the urge to partner with others, then I don't think we can uh, profess that and preach that if we don't practice it. So it's important that we make sure that the voices, the messages are coming in into the system all the time. So let us keep the uh, doors and windows open so that the, the fresh air can come in, but of course uh, not to the extent that you lose your bearings in the process. Thank you.
presentation and i think uh, we are i think we are well within time i think my panelists have taken my warning very strictly uh, when i said 5 minutes i think they are keeping it shorter than 5 minutes so i do hope that we we i hope we can uh, we can request uh, now dr grewal to go ahead Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So it's a pleasure to be amongst you, and truly enriched over the last uh, one and a half days of deliberations. Uh, I bring you greetings from uh, Sikkim Manipal University, which is located at Gangtok. It's part of the prestigious, uh, globally acclaimed Manipal brand and ecosystem, and. Uh, with uh, so i propose to be you know giving you a little insight so first i must give you a disclaimer you see i was born post dated ma'am just for your reference on time so my mom was expecting me a little you know earlier but i sort of came in later and so everything i do is a little post dated so i'll make up for the time that everyone granted me gratis okay so uh, moving forward why am i showing you this image and what is it have got to do it's it's marine life yes surely so is this so this is when there were symbiotic relationships when uh, the planet was picking up life so the first image is uh, the hermit crab and the sea anemone and they you know lived happily ever after fairy tale like and the second one is uh, interestingly you know pretty much uh, uh, the person that i am clown clown fish and sea anemone so they also got along famously well and so you know collaborations were there well before fiki and all of us are you know uh, exchanging gyan on this and i think we need to get uh, back into you know uh, unicellular life to work out uh, collaboration so clearly india brings in huge heritage and a great legacy uh, to leverage uh, networking and that is to say that uh, what's mentioned in english comes from uh, our sanskrit philosophy or rather our scriptures of vasudeva kutumbakam which is the world is one family it's a global village and that was uh, articulated in the upanishads and uh, so the theme of the g20 summit of that matter for the year that's coming up from the 1st of december to early uh, to late november of 2023 uh, where india is the anchor and the lead of the g20 and we're going to have the uh, illustrious uh, sherpa of g20 former ceo niti ayog uh Dr. mr abitab khan is joining us in a little while so i'll do a little catch up before he comes so india envisages itself to be the wish for guru and uh, so let's envision and try to configure and recreate the magic of the treasured legacy of our past uh, to be a globally acclaimed uh, center of learning in the same uh, manner that uh, nalanda and takshila were you know perceived to be uh, on the global stage many centuries back e uh, destination so why does the guru shishya parampara of india is so important and why is it to be treasured and leveraged that's because guru deva guru vishnu guru and i'm getting religious so there's no uh, bias over here but guru devo maheshwara the, the teacher was considered as an epitome of god and that was because it was he was supreme so uh, let's again uh, work towards uh, a role model india as a leader in the higher educational space by providing a holistic value addition and high benchmarks in the edu space uh, on the on the global arena uh, so this is the snail pace of international collaborations particularly on the research frontier and if you see from 1998 to 2008 in that decade they weren't any worthy international collaborations the snail wasn't even moving if it if it ever existed 
and uh, thereafter some hot spots were picked up and got leveraged a little bit but not too much but uh, US, UK, Australia and to use Bridget's terminology they are the preferred destination of the pie right okay so we go forward with that and uh, so you know what we grew as big frogs in a large landmass of a well maybe small in perceptions and perspectives so the past baggage of anti-collaboration maybe you know when we de-recognize FRCS and MRCPs and so scientists and academics got restricted they got straight jacketed and uh, it undercut uh, what was great potential and amazing opportunities which limited our ecosystem so this is another article I bring you from and that is to say the ease of doing science is enabled hugely by collaborations and there's no rocket science and uh, or brownie points for making that out and collaboration between uh, the academia the labs uh, the industry the corporate the marketplace and uh, the stakeholders beyond that is critically important if we were to look at an R&D spend of 2% of our gross domestic product okay so we need to also work in the space of the pull and push traction pull definitely much more than push and why because it has to be pan spectral multi-dimensional and this could be a quantum value addition and a key driver for changing the ecosystem that sorry I use this ecosystem too often so again uh, sustainable development goals were articulated uh, some time back but if you look at you know how sustainable are this development on the collaborative on the networking or the cooperation space well very limited uh, subject uh, related partnerships are so critically important uh, to take us forward in that space the chronicle of higher education India is in a unique part of uh, the growth curve of its you know demographic uh, dividend and that is to be leveraged and if we don't leverage it soon we be like another ger 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 gerontological fossil a relic if uh, we weren't uh, able to give these aspirational people in the 20s and 30s a future that they deserve and uh, clearly you know we should be the destination for what uh, Vikram Captain Vikram Matra I come from the same eco I mean same organization so which he sort of uh, uh, I would say copyrighted by ye dil mange more when it was the only war at Cargill, which is type uh, telecast live in your uh, in your in your living rooms. Uh, so we need to be that ye dil mange more uh, uh, you know place to be and uh, the go-to place, and uh, I'll also provide the holistic experience with our culture, its richness, and the sanskars that go with it. Okay, so quickly now here onwards, ma'am, I can see that, that you know one part of you is giving me a little bit of a dirty look. So I'll move quickly. So uh, there are these various fascinating programs which the government has just announced I'm not here to uh, talk too much about it from twinning twining or uh, dual and joint degrees uh, to uh, you know allowing the high bandwidth uh, academic institutions and universities to take uh, it to the next level and uh, this is of course the UGC chairman he goes on to say that uh, the response to foreign collaborations is truly overwhelming and clearly the the go-to destinations are uh, the US of A, the United Kingdom, Australia, Germany, Malaysia, very interestingly. If you see the number of higher education institutions which dot Malaysia, it would pretty much cover, uh, you know, a, a large component of uh, how its density. So why, uh, what, why do I bring you greetings from uh, Sikkim Manipal University? Well, it's a pioneering public-private partnership and while we're going into the pioneering space, we also need to articulate at the Manipal group 
group was a pioneer. And now, the, I mean, I would say the, uh, uh, amongst the uh, leaders in the educational, high quality, multidisciplinary, you know, uh, I would say uh, trans-dimensional space. And uh, 1953 is when Dr. TMA Pai envisaged it. So we've grown uh, with a global footprint. And uh, also we at SMU with an A plus Nagre and immodesty personified uh, uh, would like to leverage an endeavor to you know move towards progressive collaborations, network synergy, and uh, academia industry corporate linkages, which is what I'm going to talk about. So there's been some blockbuster research, some fantastic innovations, and landmark publications, and these exponentially enhance the win-win outcomes. And however, dismally so, uh, we are ranked on 4.7 out of 10 by our own institute in in terms of leveraging the space, so maybe we need to move beyond that space. So these are what expectations, you know, when one is expecting, and I know the gender expects for about uh, three trimesters, so with no bias on that frontier, the industry has expectations from the academy and vice versa, so I'm going to, one skilled workforce is what the industry expects from us, and actually various studies say that we don't provide them skilled uh, enabled and employment ready, not employable, okay? So uh, they also expect us to have, uh, you know, the market-oriented uh, alignment and academic institutions really need to adapt and enrich uh, their courses to increase the talent pool's employability and solutions for industrial concerns are really, you know, where we need to work in this space because this is the launch pad for targeted uh, interventions uh, which the industry expects from the academy, as also we need to understand what are industrial best practices and what are the market outcomes that they are looking out of. Industrial funding is unfortunately abysmally low as much as I understand it and I hope Fiki and various other stakeholders in this space can be the bridge between uh, the academy, industry and the corporates. Having said that, uh, partnerships between academy and industry are nothing new but only with the right strategy and the enterprises, they will be able to prosper, said uh, to unquote uh, Arup Daskup, the leading space scientist in the scholarly community and the industry need to work together, enhance employment avenues for students, creative alliances, flexible tech transfer facilitation is what the conveyor belt of the collaboration needs to provide and flexibility in uh, IPRs because intellectual property is the big thing and of course our alumni are our ambassadors and we need to leverage that space. So to quote the iconic uh, father of our nation, uh, we must be the change we wish to see in this world and we hope we're getting there. Uh, I would like to uh, convey uh, a profound gratitude to uh, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, uh, our esteemed chairperson, eminent luminaries, distinguished delegates and each one of you and uh, uh, look forward to more such interactions. Uh, well, uh, we have effective collaborative networks. I know my time is up and I don't need, need to know how I need to get back to decorate the furniture where I just perched myself. Thank you for listening to me. It's been a pleasure. I think you very clearly highlighted how India is emerging as a valuable partner for collaborations and the immense potential that it has. So thank you so much and uh, it was okay for you to exceed the time. I'll now request Nandita to take the And um, with the permission of the moderator, uh, we on the panel would like to wish a very happy birthday to Rajni Gupta, Professor Rajni Gupta. Uh, she has uh, come here, uh, left her family behind to spend her birthday with all of us and I think that um, that's academic collaboration for one.
<laughs> maybe after because remember that time is clicking over there <laughs> all right so uh, i am also going to take up the topic around industry collaborations which is there as part of the write up on what we are doing today uh, but just to start off with i want you to get an understanding of who we have in this room so can we have hands up how many here are academics super how many in the academic industry great and how many from business infrastructure law uh, supply chain energy okay great um this is primarily for the academics how many of you really feel like we are engaging with the industry in a robust way super your hand had to go up okay. all right um everybody doing internships yeah placements yeah master classes yes how about uh, train the trainer and industry co co branded co delivered modules for students yeah great and those who aren't you should do that as it's amazing for students uh, they get exposed to the industry and learn and get to learn directly from the industry and the industry is also happy to participate as it makes them feel good uh, it enhances their brand name too and in many cases it's a revenue generation vertical with targets and listed faculty etc so uh, industry is also happy to participate in that way and yes the industry does contribute to all of us and we're able to use their brand names have industry in the classroom our teachers get trained students are happy outcomes improve we get more enrollments it's a good cycle but the role of the university is more than just teaching students and the role of industry partnerships is more than just having industry in the classroom apart from developing skilled human capital a university is meant to become the center of society's knowledge production the knowledge production system universities are meant to and some do uh, create knowledge transfer knowledge and technology to industry and to become the seed bed of new enterprises and that is really what i want us to think about and how industry partnerships can help get us there even the traditional missions of a university are teaching research and service to industry contribution to industry and research has shown that entrepreneurial universities can also contribute to economic development attain financial advantage through commercial and industrial application of research and this is what we could all be aiming for and of course we have many who are doing it and i can see sovik nodding his head but more of us can at ups and in in university that i work with uh, there is a strong directive to shift away from commercial industry linkages where our faculty and create ones to where our faculty could actually work with the industry on research on projects create intellectual property contribute to the industry and really work side by side in areas relevant to the industry and be the ones who partner the industry instead of always looking to them for giving us direction this engages faculty it keeps them on the edge of what's happening and transmits a different energy back to the students this in turn creates new industry new networks new entities and we can all be a part of the change together this is a slow process but it's worth embarking on and we have to lead it ourselves not wait for the industry not wait for the government not wait for fiki to take the lead but we got to start ourselves i will share a few ideas as to how we can create this ecosystem and hope that you will take this conversation back into your colleges and classrooms number 1 focus on what we can change inside first our researchers mindsets attitudes openness are we open are we open to learning from others do our researchers feel like they know everything when we go into a room do we go into a room thinking about what we can learn from others or do we go into a room thinking that we know everything 
Number two, start having the conversation with industry with intent. Not just on internships and placements, but about doing research, doing joint projects, contributing as an equitable partner. And in some cases, you will find resistance, but they will overcome it and they will welcome it. Number three, try to find the right person in the company's top management to sponsor the collaboration. A strong buy-in is extremely important from the top management and will help you go a long way. Number four, have collaboration champions from both sides who really passionately want this to work. This is not the person whose job description it is. It is the person who really wants this industry collaboration to succeed. And finally, start small. It's okay. It sometimes takes years to build trust, but once that happens, the benefit will multifold and we, must, we will celebrate each victory internally and externally to encourage further success. Finally, I want to say that these collaborations are more than possible and very exciting if you try to include international academic partners as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about a very small project that was done between Pearl Academy, Dastakar, and the University of Northumbria. Dastakar is an uh, organization that helps craftspeople from all over India. They were approached by the Rajasthan government, I think this is around 12 years ago, um, when three villages were displaced as the Ranthambore sanctuary expanded. So people from these villages had, no, had lost their farming lands, they had no work to do and they were really suffering and unable to feed their families. Thus the car reached out to Pearl Academy, which is the design college, and we brought in the University of Northumbria because they had done work on marketing of crafts. And together we studied the situation, identified skills, developed skills, developed supply chain. Uh, I think it was two and a half years or so and brought the products all the way to market. Now apart from rehabilitating and building livelihoods for three villages in Ranthambo. This project developed a model which is now being used in many craft clusters, including in Kutch and in the Sundarbans. This project created a new enterprise, Dastagar Ranthambo, which is independent and doing very well. This project also developed a new Masters in Craft Cultures at Northumbria University and the embedding of craft in every year of the Pearl Academy Academy curriculum and this led to further research. So in a very small but equitable way, industry academic collaboration with long lasting knowledge creation can be really terrific and the potential and possibilities are immense. We can all do it, we just need to shift a little the way that we're looking at collaborations and we can make it happen. Thank you. Very, very, a uh, very insightful presentation. Uh, I think you very, clear, very, very nicely highlighted the practical issues that one can look at. You know, the way one can go ahead, how you can build your start small. I love the word collaboration champions that you used. And I do think that unless you, we have people like this at both ends of the spectrum, uh, collaborations don't work. Collaborations need a deep understanding of what each of the other partners needs. And then I think the story can begin. So thank you so much. And I think with that we have uh, finished one round of our discussions. Uh, may I now throw it open to questions from the audience. Uh, you may please uh, tell us your name and uh, the organization you belong to. And if the question is directed to a specific person, please mention the name and we can take it question wise. I think we are still waiting for uh, Mr. Amitabh Gant to join us. So we do have some time. So may I, yes, please, if, if you can get the mic. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Uh, a very nice presentation. I really like to thank all the panelists. I'm Keshuf Singh from Institute of Counselor Training Research and Consultancy. Just taking on from what Nandita, Dr. Nandita mentioned, that whenever we are talking about collaborations, we are always looking at external forces or outside. What all we can do, which all partners we can sign up with. But uh, Dr. Nandita talked about we have to look inwards. We have to look at our own internal ecosystem to find out what all things are there or where things are lacking. 
and are we having the right set of skills so that we can collaborate. So I would uh, like to know what all interventions as universities uh, we are doing in order to look inward to improve the psychological climate within the organization so that we are ready to collaborate. Thank you. Nandita, would you like to take that? Yeah. Thank you, Keshav. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that collaboration is something that in an organization doesn't come very naturally. In fact, sometimes we find it easier to collaborate with international partners uh, than to actually collaborate uh, within departments or even uh, between universities in India. Um, people are looking to see what's in it for them. And everybody wants to have that peer recognition, that acknowledgement, and why should I waste my time doing this unless I'm going to get something out of it. So I think a few strong case studies which can be uh, acknowledged, uh, emulated, so that people understand that really what is the benefit. You cannot tell academics what to do. They have to really experience it uh, or see it and see the peer recognition that comes out of it, etc. So encouraging small group clusters, uh, even within the university, to do things across departments, I think is one very good idea. Anybody else wants to add? Yeah, that's a, a, a really, really good question. I think the, the other thing you need is a, a strong infrastructure with, within your university so that you know who is in charge. You, you need a centralized set of people who are in charge of organizing these partnerships because what academics do is they go off and they arrange partnerships individually all over the place um, and they don't then become strategic or long-lasting or sustainable. Um, so one of the things we're doing is, is trying to put that infrastructure in place supported by a customer relationship management piece of software so that you can record all of the interactions um, and once you can do that you then have a basis to make these relationships sustainable so I think you need this the, the sort of top-down thing the bottom up and you need a very strong infrastructure in the middle um, underpinned by some some software systems really can I add my two pence bit on this would be that uh, firstly uh, we need to find out our common meeting ground where which which are the areas which uh, we there's mutual benefit accrual intra organization inter institution and uh, in a trans or a multidisciplinary domain uh, having defined that we clearly articulate the terms of engagement and that should be defined because role ambiguity can be a big impediment the other is to brainstorm and meet regularly and work towards what are tangible outcomes and where uh, the academia can be a force multiplier. And uh, clearly, as uh, Nandita very aptly uh, alluded to, I think uh, we need to start small with building blocks and confidence building measures. And that's clearly you know, the deficit which we see because pretty much we are growing in our own space with uh, little if at all any cross-pollination and that's the way forward. Thanks, ma'am. important to um, continuously look at the purpose uh, of the institution and what we are doing uh, and then uh, identify what is required from the external and what is required internally and how do we work on this, whether it is in terms of uh, the activities, function and also the strategic uh, outlook. Uh, to, again, uh, we, we talked about global rankings today morning. Uh, and then as a country, uh, when we talk about the 2030s and 2040s and say 2047, um, India would be there, but the ranking agencies may or may not necessarily be there. So we need to intrinsically look at what is it that we want. I mean, there are case studies, enough case studies of universities, for example, in Germany, where they have all along worked to uh, be a sustainable university and now they are ranked the second in, in, in the world but 
they didn't start with the ranking framework. They started because they intrinsically believed in uh, what they wanted to do. And because they were doing very well, at some point in time, much later on in life, you find that there is a ranking framework which has taken care of that particular aspiration. It's like the Padma Awards in India. If you were planning to be one of those Padma Award winners uh, 10 years ago, uh, you wouldn't get it today because you know that there's a different set of people who are getting the Padma Awards now. So the criteria and the, the, and the requirements would change. And none of those or most of those Padma Award winners that we have today were working towards the Padma Award in any case. But they intrinsically believed in what they wanted to do. So as much as the external is important and we have to be open to that, I think it's very important to reflect on what is required and what is it that we intrinsically require and work towards that. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Uh, I, uh, I want to learn from a couple of uh, case studies, a couple of examples. This is from STEM. Unfortunately, I, I don't know other areas as well. Um, I'm referring to both Australian examples and the third one on the anvil. So maybe Bridget can throw light. Uh, one is a fairly well-known IIT Bombay Monash, uh, which is working at scale, uh, doctoral research collaboration, joint PhD. And the second one, uh, which happened a little later after IIT Bombay Monash, is the IIT Delhi Queen, EQ, UQ, University of Queensland. Uh, both are very successful models. And the third one, a, a leading private university is about to launch. I'm, I'm not able to uh, share more details on that with another Australian university uh, leading one. Um, what's the learning? I mean, we are talking about an independent academic creation. We are not talking about just a you know existing program somehow twined and, and things like that. We're not talking about uh, you know very quick fix dovetailing of ac academic programs. And we're talking about independently crafted, curated program exclusively for that joint academy, which has independent you know offices and, and so on. It's a it's a major uh, uh, you know investment in time over a very fairly long uh, length of time. The design, the crafting, and all that. Is there any learning that that we could do more such? A lot of universities are doing fabulous work, particularly the, the some of the new universities uh, in the private sector, which came up in the last 10, 10, 15 years. Uh, amazing work that's being done. I, I think the government universities have no clue on on what's happening. So, is there anything? Maybe Bridget, maybe someone else. I would like I'd like to learn more. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I certainly look forward to visiting Bits Palani uh, when I'm able to. Uh, the whole question of um, STEM policy and development in that area has been of interest to me for quite some years after uh, our chief scientist commissioned some work uh, through Professor Simon Marginson when I worked with him at the Centre for the Study of Higher Education. And what we know is that uh, attracting elite uh, PhD students to education systems like Australia where we have a deficit in terms of engineering and other STEM PhD students is vitally important and we know that the IIT Bombay Monash Academy that was established as, a, as an exemplar has been replicated in Australia in about 10 other um, joint PhD academies. A couple of weeks ago when I was uh, visiting uh, Symbiosis University in Pune, I got together a focus group with uh, IIT directors and Australian University Deputy Vice-Chancellors who were involved in this group of IIT uh, Australian University Joint PhD Academies and they were fairly clear about a few things. One was that this is one element of a, a long-term mutually beneficial uh, research collaboration which also extends to some other teaching and learning opportunities and faculty exchanges. Countries like Australia benefit um, significantly from these opportunities in terms of the extraordinary contribution of young
Indian PhDs to our research and development system and they will continue to be vitally important. Some other countries have different trajectories for research collaborations which extend for example into commercialisation opportunities between universities and industry to a greater extent, particularly in those systems where R&D industry investment is higher, however the joint PhDs are fundamentally important. Uh, there's two further things just very briefly. One is that our analysis of the NEP 2020 in terms of foreign uh, bilateral education engagement suggests that there are opportunities to extend these joint PhD academies to include education PhDs. And as India's education and teacher education programs uh, are transformed over coming years, I would encourage these uh, cross-border partnerships to extend to education PhDs. The second, and just very briefly, I'm currently doing field work in India for a couple of months and I'll be returning next year for three months. Um, and I'm looking at this very question of education engagement, so I'm interested in engaging with you to learn more about these things. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome Mr. Amitabh Kant. The India's G20 Sherpa, Government of India. A very warm welcome to you, sir, and I would request Dr. Vidya to kindly present a green certificate to Mr. Amitabh Kant and welcome him. And we would like to honor you, sir, with a green certificate, which is a FIKI initiative wherein we plant a grove of 10 trees in the Sundarbans National Park, West Bengal. They will be planted in your name, sir. Thank you very much indeed for accepting it. And ladies and gentlemen, I now have the proud privilege in inviting Mr. Amitabh Kant to kindly address the August House present here. And before that, I would request Dr. Vidya Yarvadekar, Chair Fiki, Higher Education Committee, to say a few words of welcome. Known to all the participants, uh, the August panelists here who took us through a wonderful session and uh, the most awaited talk by none other than Mr. Amitabh Kant. Uh, I don't need to introduce him, uh, but I can only say that I'm a great fan of Mr. Amitabh Kant and all the dynamism and the work that he does. Uh, and we all know his, uh, you know, his tenure at Niti Aayog as a CEO. And now, of course, we're looking forward to his tenure at G20. And uh, sir, today, this uh, session is on how do you make India a global destination for higher education. And we would be really interested to know, against the backdrop of G20, what is it that education will gain. Uh, we of course have seen, uh, all of us have seen you on television, we've seen the Honourable Prime Minister speak uh, at Indonesia but uh, and we are very very proud that we will be hosting uh, G20 now and we all of us as academics definitely feel that education should get its uh, merit uh, and we just hope that the Indian education also gets branded because of the G20 over the next year. I won't take much time and I'll request you to give your special address. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vidya, uh, Dr. Rajni Gupte, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Symbiosis International University. Uh, Professor Agnes Nan, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement from the University of Bristol, Dr. Brigade Freeman, Dr. Kiran GR, uh, Dr. Lieutenant General Rajan Greval, Dr. Nandita Abraham, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am truly delighted to be here. India will be taking over the presidency of G20 on 1st of December. The Prime Minister has uh, just day before taken over the gavel, which means that uh, Indonesia is handing over the presidency to India. G20 is important because it accounts for about 85% of the global GDP. It accounts for about 78% of the global trade. 
it accounts for almost two third of the humanity but it accounts for almost 90 percent of the global patents uh, in the world and therefore it comprises of some of the most innovative and some of the most dynamic countries in the world is the only grouping which has all the G7 members but it also has all the emerging the key emerging markets so what differentiates G20 is that the United Nations is too large a body it's too uh, cumbersome with about 186 members G7 is too rich too elitist a body whereas G20 is just the right mix of both G7 and G20 this is for the first time that uh, the G20 baton is being passed over to a series of emerging markets, Indonesia, then India, then uh, Brazil, then South Africa, four developing countries one after another. And therefore, this is an opportunity really to project much of the requirement of the emerging markets as well. If you look at the global economies, what is happening is that the share of emerging markets in the global economy is growing and expanding. The share of most of the developed world has remained stagnant, whereas emerging markets have grown in terms of their growth and in terms of their contribution to global GDP. My own belief is that in the coming years, largely because of demographics, you will see a vast opportunity of uh, uh, many emerging markets growing and advancing in many areas. India is today the uh, fastest growing large economy in the world. It's done some phenomenal work in the field of digital transformation. Uh, it has the India stack, it has the jam trinity where every Indi Indian individual has uh, a digital identity. We have a di digital empowerment protection architecture. Uh, we've also seen that uh, we do fast payments in a very large manner. For instance, I have myself not used my uh, uh, debit or credit card or I have not been to a physical bank for over four years. I do all my transactions through my mobile. So we have shown how technology has enabled us to grow and prosper very rapidly. We have also uh, done several path breaking work in the field of infrastructure in the last six, seven years. We built 55,000 kilometers of roads, which is like making half of Europe. We've done, provided housing to over 3 million people, which is like providing a house to every person in Australia. We've given water connections to about 10.9 million people, which is like providing uh, water connection to every person in Brazil. Uh, we did over 2.5 billion vaccination, totally digital, paperless, physical, which is like providing uh, 7x of the population of United States and almost 6x the population of uh, Europe. So all this, the size and scale of India is phenomenal and uh, it's transformational. And therefore, all this eventually must get reflected in the field of higher education. Uh, my belief is that uh, the national higher education policy which was uh, released in July 2021 after a gap of almost 34 years since the last national education policy was in, released in 56 has some key recommendations in the domain of higher education. Uh, they are very critical as far as access, quality, multidisciplinary education, uh, internationalization, multiple exit and entry options, all these areas are concerned and therefore uh, the faster we implement, the quicker we implement, uh, it will be very critical. For instance, the NEP aims to increase the GR in higher education to 50% by 2035 and use of distance learning and online classes to increase access is very critical. For instance, in the quality, the NEP has recommended uh, some much needed disruptive reforms, very key disruptive reforms to overall the entire higher education sector, restructuring of institutions, all higher education
education institutions will be restructured into three categories. Uh, firstly, those uh, which are research universities uh, focusing equally on research and teaching. Those which are teaching universities focusing primarily on teaching. And thirdly, degree granting colleges primarily focused on undergraduate uh, teaching. And then there's a huge emphasis on multidisciplinary education uh, because uh, my belief is that uh, multidisciplinary uh, education is really the key in a country like India. Important uh, thing to understand is uh, that there is a huge amount of disruption taking place in the world. Uh, our education system must get linked to the transformation taking place on ground. If India is to grow at rapid pace at about 9 to 10 percent per annum year after year, year after year, for three decades or more, uh, if the, as the Prime Minister has spelled out that India must become a developed country by 2047, this would mean that India needs to grow at 9 to 10 percent uh, per year uh, for the next 25, 30 years. And that means we need to produce quality people to transform India on ground. That means that a huge emphasis will have to be laid on R&D. There's a huge emphasis which needs to uh, be laid on uh, converging and integrating with industry. There's a huge, uh, uh, eventually India will grow if we become innovative. India will grow and expand if we are able to do a massive amount of disruption. We've seen the rapid pace at which we've seen uh, the startup movement in India. We've seen the rapid pace in which we've done digital disruption in India. But if you talk to many of our startups, when we started the Startup India movement, there were just about 186 startups in India. Today there are 86,000 startups. Today there are we have over 110 unicorns in India. We add a, we've added a huge amount of value in terms of these are the people who've disrupted. So on top of the payments that we do, we've seen many startups doing credit, many startups who've participated in wealth management. Uh, you know, startups like Zeroda, etc., who do wealth, personal wealth management, and many like Digit and Aqua, etc., who do insurance, etc. This is all being done paperless, cashless. Nowhere in the world was it does this happen, which is paperless and cashless. But when you talk to these startups, they tell you actually that there is a very major shortage. There is a huge shortage of skilled manpower, of product developers, of people who are able to use the vast amount of data that India is throwing up, huge amount of data. The challenge for India is that it, it has huge amount of data. So if you need use cases, India, if it has to solve problems of education, health, agriculture, uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, which means vast amount of data, you need AI specialists, you need ML specialists, you need uh, people who use the power of real-time data to find solutions to the problems of India. And if India is able to find problems, solutions to the challenges of India, then you are able to find solutions not to the, for the 1.4 billion people of India, you are actually finding a solution for the next 5 billion people of the world who will be moving from poverty to middle class. And therefore you need a lot of more skilled manpower for product development, you need a lot of more skilled manpower for AI, you need a lot of skilled manpower for machine learning, and my belief is that much of the curriculum that we've designed is totally outdated and not in sync with the present world if you have to cause disruption. Even uh, much of the curriculum which have been designed in both triple IITs and IITs I think is totally out of sync because all curriculums are designed without interacting with industry, without interacting with startups, without realizing the vast and the rapid pace with which they have moved forward. And therefore my belief is that huge amount of work needs to be done. There's another startup called Scalar. I don't know how many of you have heard of Scalar. And what the Scalar has done is to produce out, produce uh, skilled manpower within six months for what the industry requires. It's all online learning. So Scalar is actually providing a huge amount of skilled manpower for in specialized for product development. When we were doing product, you know, the Prime Minister had asked us that use the COVID period to do a lot of product development for the 
post covid period and then suddenly we realize that there is a massive shortage of product developers in india so i think what needs to be done is education institutions need to reorient them to selves to the requirement of india for the next decade or two decades or three decades and that would require you to work very closely with uh, uh, very very closely with startups it would require you to work very closely with our industries it would require you to work very closely with our manufacturing companies and reorient totally uh, in requirement with the curriculum the next other point i have been a great believer that uh, uh, social sector uh, i have been uh, i worked very closely with in the aspirational district program which is about uh, really transforming 112 districts of india 115 districts of india based on uh, where they were these were some of the most backward districts of india we did never call them backward we called them the aspirational districts based on real time flow of data so we captured real time flow of data on 49 outcomes we put there we made every single data come on real time basis we put their competitive ranking across various outcomes in public domain we named and shamed districts and collectors and there was a huge competition and the mere use of data in governance and data for governance is really the key how do you use real time data to transform districts and if you start using we did this in ease of doing business we started ranking states the first year we did this uh, gujarat came first next year we did this andhra beat gujarat the third year we did this telangana beat gujarat and maharashtra but the good thing was that chatisgarh and jharkhand which were 24th and 25th they jumped up and came fourth and fifth so how do you use data for governance is very very important to my mind and that will have to be a very key part of our entire education process because when i was a young collector in kerala data was not available real time today data is available real time on your mobile and you should be we should be able to capture this data used to come 6 years 7 years later published by the department of statistics all that is irrelevant now the whole world has gone through a disruption india is the only country which will give you real time data that real time data must be compared with other uh, other uh, performances we should do block level analysis we should do district level analysis and put it out in public domain and that is what educational institutions uh, must restructure our whole academic institution into thirdly i am a great believer that uh, indian uh, education institutions uh, throughout throughout a vast amount of innovation we've been able to restructure our patent regime our trademark regime a lot of work needs to be done through academic institutions they should become centers of r&d every single institution that we have created outside education institutions that is csir institutions etc should go back and get linked to the education institutions america is a great great country in terms of innovation merely because all innovation takes place in universities and therefore all institutions which were created outside universities should get linked to universities and colleges that's my belief without getting linked to universities innovations will not happen and they must become the drivers of growth and uh, dynamism in india and therefore all institutions which government create must always be linked to academic institutions and thirdly my belief is which has been stressed that if india is to become a great sporting nation great sporting nation if you look around the world all sporting olympic champions come out of universities they don't come from some companies or something they come from universities so there should be a huge huge you know our universities our colleges must actually pick up the best champions out of the school systems give them extra quotas produce great sports champion all all champions of china all champions of america all champions all over the world are products of universities and colleges and therefore all sports champions must be produced by universities fourthly uh, i am a great believer myself that uh, social education and science education must get co-linked uh, i am a great believer that uh, in india we've 
built up silos. Uh, a great uh, scientist can also be a great musician. A great uh, fashion designer can also be a great scientist. Uh, it's the multidisciplinary aspect of education which is very, very critical, very, very important in India. And that is the way the multidisciplinary approach, the world has moved towards a multidisciplinary approach. And therefore, bringing in multidisciplinary uh, focus into education will really be the key uh, to the growth and progress of India. I am a great believer that uh, Indian education institutions really hold the key to India's growth and prosperity. Uh, if India has to achieve high levels of growth, uh, this is really uh, my belief that uh, uh, we are at the cusp of us economic and social transformation. We have already witnessed the transformation of the domestic level. Now is the time to drive digital inclusion because uh, 400 billion people in the world today uh, do not have uh, uh, a digital identity. Almost 200 billion people do not even have a bank account. 133 countries do not have a bank, have a fast payment mechanism. So there's an opportunity for all of us to study the India model and take it to the world. Uh, 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 the, re uh, the new education policy to my mind is very revolutionary. It is a cornerstone of our efforts to improve higher education and uh, therefore uh, we should push for many of these uh, things, access, quality, multidisciplinary approach. And last point I want to make is about uh, internationalization because high performing Indian universities uh, must be encouraged to set up campuses in other countries. Similarly, selected top global universities must be permitted uh, to operate in India. And uh, I am a great believer that uh, as we open up more and more, uh, India must become the center of attracting some of the best students from abroad. We must become the center of, instead of sending vast number of students abroad, and I have no objection to that. <coughs> Our good universities must also be able to attract the best, uh, uh, best students from abroad and at least the best one must uh, strive to get the best students from across the world. There's, uh, secondly, uh, you know, this uh, whole business of multiple eg exit and entry option. This will ensure that students from socio-economically disadvantaged backgrounds can continue to study based on their convenience and an academic bank of credit can be established to digitally store academic credits earned from various higher education institutions for awarding degrees based on credits. Uh, I'm a big believer in leveraging technology to usher in transformation change at a very, very huge scale. India's experience in leveraging technology for the greater good has been, uh, has really paid us very handsome dividend. We have actually technologically leapfrogged in many areas of growth. Uh, it, it's uh, Now it's the time to expand the use of technology social sectors such as health and education to my mind are truly ripe for this transformation particularly education and India's new education policy is, is a, actually a very responsive uh, to the clarion call to integrate technology at every level of uh, instruction uh, the answer to transformation on social sector lies in digitization and technology uh, because of our robust tech proven technology I think many education institutions We'll learn how we've graduated, moved, and really disrupted the digital transformation model. This is a huge, huge opportunity for the education area, and higher education institutions uh, will learn from this model and transform themselves, uh, become more open, more inclusive, more flexible, more uh, vibrant, more dynamically, uh, uh, you know, uh, dynamically uh, able to grasp the changes taking place across the world and become great institutions of learning to take India to a high trajectory growth. Because without higher education institutions, India can never grow, it can never prosper. Uh, prosper. And this is a massive opportunity. And as we do this, I think this will also be an opportunity to uh, display much of what we are doing in higher education during the G20 movement. And we'll be very happy to collaborate and work in partnership with all of you to project the transformation that is taking place in India and to learn from many of the G20 countries and in collaboration. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you much indeed, sir, for that motivational address. Ladies and gentlemen, let's once again put our hands together for Mr. Amitab Khan for sparing his valuable time and gracing this occasion. Yeah, and uh, just a minute. Sir? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, uh, 
can can we have a q and a i mean we otherwise won't get mr amitabh khan like there are any so. questions yeah you may get phone to you kindly keep your questions to the point and very brief we have questions at the back can you please i'm, I'm sorry sir yes yes you may you may at the back there Uh, I have the mic. Yeah, you have the mic. Okay. Hi, my name is Nitin Khetripal. I'm a career coach and India's only networking coach for students. And I also do some work with All India Radio, where I talk with the world moving. Uh, it's not a question; it's a small, humble request. Uh, I am requesting Mr. Amitabh Khan and the entire panel here. This nation, this world needs Ministry of Networking. That's my humble request. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you send the mic back there? Thank you, Mr. Kant, for your very uh, passionate um, words to all of us here, and for your incredible work uh, at Niti Aayog and after. My name is Amrita Sadarangani. I am executive director to the Gujarat Biotechnology University, University of Edinburgh project. Uh, this initiative is uh, from driven by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of Gujarat. It's a hugely ambitious project to uh, set up a university that is state-funded, translational, and focused on impact for society. It brings in the University of Edinburgh, which is globally ranked 15, uh, to deliver a curriculum that is live, based on global best practice, transformation of faculty through support, and a lot of exposure. for faculty and students across these two institutions i wanted to ask whether this kind of uh, transformational work uh, across internationalization impact industry collaboration as a model is something that the wider community is aware of and whether this might be considered as a model to follow rather than the usual tne or uh, traditional collaboration that we see No, so from what uh, you've described, it appears to be a very good model, and uh, I think the the key is in um, two things. One is about uh, not just the model, but about delivery on ground. So once you succeed, uh, fully succeed, I think we should try and replicate it in many other areas with many other universities as well, in many many other not merely biotechnology, but many many other areas as well. Uh, the important thing is to uh, not merely have the framework, but also to deliver on that. i think which i am quite sure you will do in the coming years so as you go along please make a case study out of it and uh, i think in all uh, uh, such workshops or seminars we should then present a case study out of it so that many other it's it's also about learning from each other all the time and that's important good afternoon sir i'm sunil uh, danwani uh, expert in higher education sector strategy and uh, planning i'm almost 17 years of experience based in gandhinagar and working with the corporate to for their upcoming institute in and around new city area sir uh, when you talked about that during the covid we were working for the product designer or the product developer and the people are not available sir the problem is ugc and aict define the model curriculum and the branches today do the university when we talk about the engineering mostly students talk about the ict computer and it can we work out something that there will be no more than certain percentage of the it seats in total to the total engineering seats and can we give the freedom to the universities to design the curriculum outside the ugc model curriculum to develop the functional or the domain experts than the mechanical engineer or electrical engineer or the civil engineer instead the expert of something as a functional or the domain experts can we work on those line and can we develop the institutional framework beyond the skill uh, development more on the energy or uh, engineering and technology development thank you sir
So, um, I don't know what the thinking in the ministry is, but I am a great believer that at least the top universities must get the freedom to design their own curriculum. Uh, all wisdom does not lie in government, and I am a great believer that all wisdom does not lie with uh, UGC and AICT. I am a great uh, believer in decentralization. Universities which have delivered, which have performed well, uh, and we should start off with the best top 10 or top 15 or top 100, whatever you want to define. Give them the freedom to design their curriculum. They, you know, you have to build a very uh, market-oriented uh, model. The students will come if you deliver. Uh, if you don't deliver, students will not come. It's, it's directly correlated to the job market. If you are able to build a curriculum which the market demands, then students will come and join you. And therefore, I'm a great believer in giving huge amount of, huge, huge amount of freedom to the good performing universities and colleges. And this is overdue to my mind. Ma'am, uh, with your permission, may I, I know uh, speaking after Mr. Amitabh Khan is like showing a candle to the sun. I I am not an expert on education at all. I am not an, at least of all I am an expert on higher education. I am I speak from my heart of what I feel needs to be done for I, you people are experts, but I really feel that there's a need for greater freedom, there's a need for greater flexibility, there's a need for greater autonomy. All these are perspectives which are inbuilt into the national education policy, the new policy. That's very progressive, that's very forward looking. We just need to fast track its implementation now. So, may I, uh, so must compliment you on a very pertinent question. Uh, I think the Indian educational habitat is a trifle, if not more than that, over-regulated. And towards this end, uh, the visionary uh, national education policy, which is again aspirational, uh, endeavors to de-emphasize the over-regulated framework thereby creating a single body wherein they will have a national assessment council than so many other bodies which uh, are into the machismo space of defining how you need to go in straight jacketed silos of cocoon comfort zones and you know get uh, restricted in the uh, limited space of curricula syllabi and assorted learning outcomes, objectives, or whatever they call it. Having said that, I think the future is bright, and I think the union government is in the right direction in the space that we hope that the education sector would have uh, the uh, widening of horizons, enhancement of perspectives, and value addition in our outcomes to go beyond uh, the frontiers which we have put on ourselves in shackles in. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I think the policies framework is great. It's the implementation that is now the key. Uh, with that, let me just bring this session to an end. Uh, thank you, my dear panelists, all of you, for the wonderful interaction that we've had. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Dean, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together as I request our eminent panel for a grow photograph. And I also once again take this opportunity to thank Mr. Amit Tapkanji for sparing his valuable time and gracing this occasion. And sir, definitely everybody present here do second your sentiments that higher education is certainly going to play a major role in the upcoming growth of India in the upcoming Amrit Kal, that is the next 25 years of our country's growth, the Amrit Kaal. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, closing this session, requesting everybody to kindly remain seated as we are straight away moving to the next session. Just give us two minutes while we arrange the top table for the next session. And meanwhile, ladies and gentlemen, may I once again remind everybody about the feedback forms. All those who have not received the feedback forms may kindly take it from the left-hand side, my left-hand side of the stage and all
those who have received may kindly if you spare a few minutes fill in the feedback forms and hand over to our support staff here next to the stage thank you very much indeed for your participation once again requesting everybody to kindly remain seated as we are straight away moving to the next panel discussion session which is also the final session of panel discussion before the concluding session we'll just take few minutes to arrange the top table